Welcome back to the Bridge Club podcast. This is your host, Ruffin. And today I am chatting with Claire Bernacki, principal investor at BBG Ventures, one of the most active investors in women and other underrepresented founders in the US. Past investments include Zola, Spring Health, and Blue Land. Prior to BBG Ventures, Claire pursued her MBA at Columbia Business School, and she started her career in investment banking and private equity. Lots of great learnings and takeaways from this episode. So I hope you enjoy. Okay, so before venture capital, you pursued a career in finance, working with Bank of America, and then private equity with Pomona Capital. So do you want to just start off by sharing like what first inspired you to pursue a career in finance and how you broke into the space? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think maybe not the most sexy area anymore, but at the time um, I went to UNC for undergrad and kind of went in as a math major, really just like knowing I liked analytical challenges and didn't really like know at all what I wanted to do. I took, I think it was through Calc three and then pretty quickly was like, this is not applicable to um, anything that's practical and, you know, had friends applying to the business school at UNC. And so both of my parents actually were in sales. So kind of like a different side of business, but um, felt like that was a good blend of analytics and then communication skills. And then, you know, took a couple of classes, took corporate finance, I think kind of just learned that investment banking was like a job where you learn a lot and um, can kind of get a to speed like pretty quickly on um, a number of different industries and just felt like it would be kind of a fun first career path. I honestly didn't really like even know what investment banking was until I was in it. Neither my parents went to college and so just felt like a fast track to like learning a lot as a first job. And it it was that I think, you know, in your two years, you um, learn kind of just like work best practices as well as um, have the opportunity to, though it's like a lot of hours, you know, work on some pretty cool transactions as well and get exposure to CEOs of companies, which could be a lot of fun, but there's also like less fun pieces of the job. And so I think, you know, though it was a fun two years, kind of felt like I wanted to move over to the investing side. Um, Though at Bank of America, we were actually Um, underwriting deals off of uh, Bank of America's balance sheet. And so kind of was always wearing an investor hat truly from day one. And so got the opportunity with Pomona Capital, which they were, they're a secondaries fund as well as they do some co-investments some direct investments. Um, And so really kind of saw a full landscape of investing, which for me was helpful because I think I wasn't quite sure, like, is it private equity? Is it venture? And though we leaned a lot towards private equity, and that's like kind of the traditional path coming out of banking, um, kind of, you know, wanted to see the the bird's eye view of what investing looks like. And we, we even touched some venture capital at Pomona, though that wasn't where we were spending most of our time. But I think that kind of like piqued my interest and, in, okay, like, what is venture? Is this something I might want to do down the line? And after a couple of years there, I built actually like some LP relationships, which is interesting because, you know, as a Pomona is actually an LP and some funds too. And so that was kind of, you know, the other side of um, something that you t- sometimes come into venture and then need to build that network, which I'm, I'm still building it, but it was nice to have that from day one, you know, ultimately thought about um, the landscape and felt like venture was interesting and wanted to be closer to the company at the end of the day. And so went to business school from there, which we could talk more about um, separately, but kind of went to business school to test where within the earlier stage landscape I wanted to play. Yeah. Before we talk a little bit about business school, because everyone's always interested in that topic. So definitely want to hear about your experience. Um, One, insane that you even did Calc 3 in college. I think I did like intro Calc and was like, this is insane. So I can't imagine Calc 3 (laughs) at a college level. Did you have like a specific like sector focus in investment banking and private equity? Or were you like looking at different types of companies? So I was in leverage finance. So we were doing debt financing for either LBOs for private equity or bond transactions um, as well. And so within that's kind of like a product group. And then we were verticalized in that I covered industrial, super hot category, and then healthcare, which I leaned into the healthcare side a little bit more. And that's an area now that at BBG, I spent a lot of time in. Um, At Pomona, I honestly 
did not have, I was truly a generalist there because you're looking across so many funds and like kind of opportunistically investing in some of their companies. It's like a much more high level, like, you know, going um, not super deep on like any industry. And I, I think that can be, it can be hard to, you know, feel like you're differentiated in anything that you're doing. So wanted to be more focused um, from a company perspective and industry perspective. When you decided you were curious about venture capital, is that like why you decided to pursue your MBA at Columbia or what was kind of your goal going into business school? Yeah. So I actually spent, I took the GMAT the year before I applied and you know, it's a big like financial decision as well. And so wanted to feel pretty confident that I wanted to go to business school before going. So I think probably spent more time reflecting, which I think served me ultimately and being really intentional in business school. I know I have lots of friends who like get to school and are, you know, trying to quickly figure out like what they want to do. And I think I did a lot of that work up front. Um, So kind of spent that year thinking um, and, you know, ultimately wrote my business school essay about wanting to, I was growth stage investing at the time, which is not what I'm doing, but um, investing in female founders kind of in the like health arena, um, which is, you know, as, there, there are some overlaps not entirely where I landed. Pretty close, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. It's like pretty, it's funny to look back because, you know, I, I veered away from that a little bit as well during school, but that was kind of the hypothesis. And so yeah, went to Columbia and was like, I really just want two years to, in a kind of safe environment to play around with like many different potential iterations of that and was curious. I've always been kind of on the investment side and that's where I landed, but like wanted to see, do I like operating? Um, What does that look like? Do I want to start even a company? Um, And so worked at a couple of funds, one called Cult Capital that was like literally through a cold outreach prior to going to business school, just like trying to do a pre-MBA internship to start to learn. And then like worked at a startup called Coyo, um, worked at Lair Hippo over the summer, worked at a company called Studs um, that Lair had invested in and introed me to before they had even launched, which was like obviously quite, quite early. And so ended up kind of like learning along the way that I, I liked earlier stage more and more. Um, and even worked on kind of an at-home testing company uh, with a couple of friends during business school before this was like pre-COVID. So before kind of all of that home testing took off. Um, And so really like wore every hat and I think kept it kind of constrained within like early stage entrepreneurship operating or investing, you know, really was kind of like staying curious and not so much like I think now there's sometimes pressure to fall, you know, pick a path and like stick super true to it. But I think you can kind of similar to um, a startup, you know, you can learn along the way and then like iterate or change kind of the direction that you want to go in. So that was the strategy that I pursued during school. Can you share a bit more? You mentioned the first VC fellowship or internship was cold outbound, but can you share strategy around how you landed the other opportunities? So my first internship was actually through a club and I just, I think, applied and then went through a process. And so that's the one of the perks of business school is like there's many, many opportunities that come about. And I think even more so with at the time I was doing all of this in person and felt like being in New York was really helpful to do that. But now there's like a lot of remote opportunities, obviously. Um, and so, you know, that was that was how I found the first one. And then I think Lara Hippo was actually I think it was the first summer where they had posted um, externally the role. And so really, I think I saw, you know, had I had a target list of like funds at the time, as well as some companies. Um, and so once I saw that, like applied super quickly. And I do think like, even as I've managed our process, like it can be helpful to get in early, because I think, you know, as there's more and more applicants, if you have totally. a strong pool, like there's, you know, just 
you're not going to go through as many. So um, I think that coupled with like I had sent a couple of people on the team, like thesis work around a similar time. And then like once I got my first interview, like I did this with the one I was like cold outbound for. I did this with BBG. Like I just went super hard at the assignment, which sounds like so basic, but I think like you know, just random, like cold outreach to people who had like connections to team members or founders or like anything I could do to really like back channel or get up to speed, which is, you know, what we're oftentimes doing in the job. But like, obviously I didn't have the same connections that I do now, but I remember like Isabel there even a, like a couple of years ago was like, yeah, I just remember you had like all of these people you'd reached out to and like that stood out to her. So I think just like really, you know, giving it your all um, can stand out in the process. So that was, you know, that was just like through an application. And then once I had that, that helped with studs was like through the Lara Hippo team. And then BBG was just like through knowing Lara. And then also the studs team knew BBG as well. So um, it starts to compound. I feel like it's like just getting your first yes. Yes, exactly. You mentioned you're obviously on the hiring side of venture. Anything you look for in applications or like anything that stands out to you? or anything people can be doing to like break into these spots? Yeah, I've always told people like you want to show that you can do the job before you have the job. Um, and so when you think about the components of the job, it's like sourcing, diligence, portfolio support. Um, so that can look like sending VCs, companies that could be a good fit for them. Um, obviously like diligence doing well on the assignment, but maybe it's like, hey, here's a company that I've been digging into on the side and like, you know, a mini memo on it and you send that to someone. Thesis work I didn't cover, but that's a component. And so a lot of people will put together like a couple pages on an industry that they're interested in. Um, and then portfolio support, like maybe that's like you're an operator and you're consulting on the side, working with companies and like reach out to a, com a VC and say like, here's a couple of things I think I can help with in your portfolio. It's being really proactive in the process and trying to add value. I think a lot of people do these like networking conversations, but they're like, you should bring something to the table during those. And so it's, um, you know, making people, even if it's like through a 15 minute catch up, like want to catch up with you again in the future because you brought something to the table. Before we get into BBG Ventures. Um, you mentioned earlier that you were obviously considering like the financial implications of pursuing an MBA. I think that was something like you really feel like after school, at least personally going through UCLA, you kind of underestimate it a little bit because it's not only like there's the cost of school, there's the cost of the application. There's also giving up a salary for two years. Do you think the MBA has been worth it to you? Yes. Um, it's a great question. I think it's funny. I have friends who would say yeah, no. Totally. Um, so it's, it's not worth it for everyone. I think if you're looking to make like a pretty significant pivot, it can be worth it. I think even now, like, I, I'm curious your take, but I think the MBAs, you know, evolved a bit in that it's not like for us. I don't even know that coming out of Stanford. And yeah. I feel bad saying this, but like, I don't know that it's like the founder breeding ground that it like yes. used to be. I think the MBA is veered a little bit from what it was, but I think if you're looking to reposition yourself and for me, like I, you know, thought about different scenarios and was like downside case, like, do I think it's worth it, worth it at this point in my life to like reset my professional network and personal network? Like I went to UNC, which is it's a good school, but I like, I felt like there was opportunity to just kind of um, refresh my network and um, thought it would be valuable in like a downside case regardless and like kind of knew I would get that. Um, but then, you know, upside was obviously, I think pre-business school, I can't say that like I loved my job and kind of like went to school to really find something that aligned like my passions and personal interest with my career. Um, and so, you know, felt like the testing process would be valuable and then obviously like landed something that I was really, really excited about. So um, I think it was worth it. It's obviously a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, I think even now, um, especially in venture, like when network can be valuable, like 
the number of operators I can reach out to to like help support some of our companies or obviously people in venture founders. Uh, and I think that will like continue to compound over time. So um, yes, I'm very glad that I went. Yeah. And I do think it's like the business school has changed a bit. I happen to be like, I feel like the year where things started to change because I went during 2020. So like I had a full like virtual COVID experience, which was interesting. Um, And I think my take is like, I think I'm so glad I went and I made the absolute most of it. Like I started Bridge Club, I started my TikTok, my social media. But I think what I learned is like, I could have started all this without going to school but I also think if I had not if I had been working full-time I don't know if I would have had the mental space to like create this like I can't say the classes or you know really anything that I was doing during it was like just the time for myself I actually just like did not go to class honestly and I spent all my time working which it sounds like you were doing a lot of working too so (laughs) so would love to shift gears a little bit to BBG Ventures, can you share a bit about one, like what your investment thesis is and to what your specific role is at the firm? Yeah. So our thesis, um, you know, we've been around since 2014. We were one of the first to put a stake in the ground around investing in female founders. And at the time thought of women as the dominant consumer. Our thesis today has evolved when you look at the makeup of um, Americans today for the first time under 18s are majority non-white. And so we've broadened our thesis to include diverse founders. And that's just an evolution from kind of thinking of women as the dominant consumer to just America being much more diverse and that having an impact on um, kind of core needs. And so we actually are putting out research around this later this year, but did a survey around kind of the core needs of Americans and align our focus areas with those needs. So health, work, education, climate, community, which um, is kind of the lens through which we'll do some consumer investing, financial security. Um, so those those are kind of the, the high level areas, both B2B and B2C. Lots of fun. I spend most of my time and I mentioned a little bit healthcare and then work and through work, a lot of that's like vertical SaaS or SMB owners who are oftentimes um, diverse or female founders as well. Um, So that's that's the focus is um, in terms of my role, I'm a principal on the team. So primary uh, responsibilities are, you know, investing, sourcing, thesis work, and then supporting our companies post-investment. You know, there's obviously like little bits of fundraising or, you know, LP relationships, annual meeting, things outside of, we're a small team. So there, there's things outside of kind of the core job that um, are probably more common at a smaller fund than um, a more established larger fund. But um, for everyone listening, can you share or you remind me seed pre-seed what's like kind of the split there so we do pre-seed and seed um a little bit more seed than pre-seed but um are typically pretty early we're leading um and so do have kind of ownership targets check size is kind of 500k to 2 million on average um but that that's the core model you know there's always exceptions to that but um that's where most of our investing is and then maybe like Is there a company or a recent investment that you've been super excited about that um, you can share to paint an even better picture of the thesis? Yeah. So one that I led a little bit earlier this year that I'm excited about because she just signed her first contract um, pre-seed investment, a company called Max Home. And this is um, a founder that came out of Better, um, which is the real estate company. She was quite early there um, and built their real estate business um, kind of from the ground up and so had a lot of relationships and saw this pain point around like setting up the transaction process and actually was working with like some lower cost people and um, just saw a lot of opportunity to use AI to improve this end to end. Um, And so it's essentially vertical software for real estate brokerages. And there's you may have heard kind of this regulatory change where the buyer's fee is starting to go away. And so they're starting to feel, and I actually like wasn't even aware, this was before that had come into place, but like she knew this was coming out. Um, And so they're feeling a lot of pressure around like reducing cost, improving um, kind of optimization. And so 
there's a lot of like opportunity um, and momentum in the industry. And it's also like a pretty um, network driven industry and um, the larger players like make up a significant share. So if you can establish like a presence amongst those, then you can get to scale pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, I met her actually, I was in San Francisco and um, we try to host events like for people starting to build things like pretty early and heard about her just through um, like some other folks in the ecosystem, but it was like before she really had fleshed out the idea and then stayed in touch. Um, so when she was ready to raise, uh, we were already connected. So yeah, really excited about that one. My mom actually owns a boutique brokerage in Charlotte oh. actually, um, oh, but like- cool. Yeah, I mean, this topic of like the buyer's commission going away, there's going to be a huge impact. So yeah, yeah, I'd be curious to see what happens. Um, yes, that's so cool. Amazing. So for folks that like might want to meet someone, you or someone on your team, like outside of events, like if someone's not in New York or San Francisco, like any advice on like getting into your inbox and getting kind of in front of your team? Yeah. So I mean, all of our emails are not hard to guess they're like our name at bbgb.com but i think you know we also have hello at uh bbg which is where we like we check that regularly and definitely you know have done deals through cold inbound um so i think it's really just about not doing kind of the like obvious blast to a million people or like you know sometimes we'll get the white male founding team that like reaches out to us. So just being intentional, looking at the website, calling out why you think you're like a good fit for our thesis with like some relevant investments that you resonate with you, just a you know, tailored email like you would in any sales process. And I think if it's something that's in thesis, like we're likely to opt in. You mentioned a little bit about like LPs and how that is part of your job. Uh, so your team closed a $57 million dollar fund for last year or had your first close for fund for excuse yeah, me first close. um can you share some insights just into like the fundraising process as an lp and like some maybe lessons you've learned yeah i know it's a great question and yeah we did our first close we're still raising just like founders you know it's a harder market for emerging managers it's our second fund um but i think just you know and it, the partners do primarily lead the process though like i am involved as we go deeper with LPs um, and also um, and pretty close to creating all the materials and like similarly with our annual meeting and our existing investors, um, like stay pretty close in touch with them. So I'm doing less like top of funnel, but I think the theme is the relationships that you build similar to fundraising for, um, for companies too, the relationships that you build early uh, though they might can not convert immediately, like can pan out over time. And then creating brand new relationships when you're raising can like be much harder and take much more time. So I think with our first close, you know, we saw some folks that we had been getting to know over a longer period of time come into that close, which is super um you know, exciting and great to see that they were impressed by kind of what we demonstrated with the first fund. Um, but then now, um, you know, we're, we're continuing, the, the race is going well and seeing good momentum, but I think it's just getting new folks up to speed, um, you know, takes a little bit longer than those in the first close. So I think that's the biggest thing, especially with fundraising, the value of relationships. Yeah, totally. And I feel like there's, I'm sure, at least I see on the founder side, investor updates and things where you can like continue to up people, Keep them up people. in the loop yeah yes. and so we do that through like updates on our deals or kind of things that we're seeing we have kind of a regular deal digest that we send to um, both vcs and investors um and lps so that's a good way to keep people warm. So now that you've been in VC for a while, what have been maybe like your favorite parts of the job and maybe some parts of the job that are like more difficult or maybe things that you don't love about the job? I'll never like not enjoy doing a deal. Like I think I just, you know, I've literally always worked in a deal oriented environment and it just like gives you this like it's like thrilling like I think as you dig in like it feels a little bit especially with venture like it feels a little bit like a puzzle that you're trying to put together and um as you like learn more and more like I just get really like 
excited by it. Um, and I think, you know, that's some people joke like that's when you like the company the most, like, right? <laughs> right when you close the deal. And then like, you know, many things go up and down along the way. But um, yeah, getting a deal over the line is always super exciting. Um, I mean, I think there's also, as I've matured in the role, have leaned in more with companies and now I'm able to lead investments independently. Um, and so I think the relationships that I've started to own, where it's really like one that I let start to finish and then feel like I'm adding a lot of value post-investment. And I think it's easier when you're early because there's just a lot of like pattern matching and kind of like best practices to running companies where that we can, you know, help, help our companies with. But um, I think working closely with companies and that's something like coming out of business school, I really wanted that part's really fun. And then when you see the impacts, like as they, you know, at the early stage, you see kind of so quickly, like how things can start to go well. Um, and so that that's really fun too. Um, so those are, I mean, obviously you're meeting like great people every day too, like in pitches. So it's, it's, there's many, many fun parts about the job. Um, I mean, I think not so fun parts, right? Like you're, and I think this is a pretty common answer, but you're just like saying no a lot. And I think it's like, sometimes it's all, we don't do, you know, we do less than 10 deals a year. And so, um, we're, we're saying no a lot of the time. And sometimes that's like, can come down to portfolio construction. Like we just, you know, either like the check size is kind of like outside of our targets or we, you know, just did a lot in healthcare and we're trying to move away as an example, that's not necessarily the case at all. But um, I think it's just, it's so like not even personal to the company, but I think can be sometimes like, you know, it's the founder's time and you want to be mindful of that too. So um, that's probably the worst part. Thank you for clarifying that. Cause I feel like there's so much that goes on behind these nose where it literally could be like nothing to do with like the founder of the company. It's like truly just because it doesn't fit into the portfolio or like what stage if you're at the end of the fund investing, like there's so many things that I feel like founders don't always realize. Yes, exactly. Can you share a bit more about how you come in and support founders after you invest in them? Yeah. So kind of from our first meeting, we like to align on like what the path to the next round looks like, um, which kind of sounds crazy to do right after <laughs> you raised a financing round, but um, time can like time just goes by quickly. And so I think even if it's not, and it's not like necessarily a KPIs, but I think it's kind of like what like what are we trying to accomplish with this round, which we actually even ask in diligence. So like to understand that founders have started to think about it. Um, so we, we align on that as a team and like obviously it will change over time, but like to kind of and we actually in the background are like talking to Series A investors who could lead the next financing round about kind of like what they're seeing, what they want to see, um, what success would look like, like what needs to be de-risked in the business over time. Um, so we align on that. And I think a big part of our job is supporting with fundraising. And there's a lot of kind of just like best practice around that. I created like a Series A playbook deck that we now um so we have like a systematic way for all of our team members to walk companies through the series a process we've like put that together um so fundraising is a big piece we also have an operator network that's formalized and i think you know when we first started the partners had really great um operator connections and still do but i think that's a way for as we scale to have folks kind of outside of the investment team to come in and really work closely with our companies on product or marketing or go to market or sales you know i haven't done all of those things firsthand i can speak to it from what i've seen with our companies but it's better to have someone who's like bed boots on the ground so um i think outside of the operator network, like we do think of ourselves as great connectors. Um, and so when we think like something is either like critical right now for a company to figure out, or like there's a blocker or critical for that next round, like we try to bring in the like amazing connection that's going to help the company figure something out. So I would say those are kind of like the two core areas. There's also, you know, obviously like hiring will, we have a platform associate who has um, a really great network from 
um, working with executives in her prior role um, at a search firm. And then we also, as a team, will collaborate on that um, and some like press stuff as well. I think brand is like a big area we can add and something we think a lot about too. Um, but I would say those are kind of um, secondary areas to those two big core areas. Can you share a bit around what you are seeing at the Series A and like any kind of like metrics companies should be going for right now? Yeah, it's a tough market. The bar is high. Um, I think, you know, I hate to give a number because I've seen companies with less than a million in revenue raise. And then for some, it's like, 5 million in revenue. So the range is pretty wide. I think like what's really key is showing momentum in the business and like consistent month over month growth. Um, if you are, especially on the lower end of that number, but like what's most important is like you've started to demonstrate product market fit and like a repeatable sales motion. So um, if you have like a couple of customers that are large chunky contracts, but like you haven't been able to do that time over time, like it's probably too early to go out to raise the A. You, like Series A investors want to see that something's like starting to work in that motion. Um, and so I think too, it's hard for, you know, some companies have like a number of revenue channels or ways they acquire customers, but it's like really like what is that? path that you have the most conviction on and like is that starting to work i think that's like the most simplistic way to describe it and then there's obviously like unit economics and um you know as a backup plan most often like what is the path to profitability and like understanding some of those things but i think it's it's really starting to see like the growth if you add more money to the company like will growth continue to work, you know? Amazing. On the topic of metrics, I'm asking all investors to pick either a startup, a VC term, something that you would like to like debunk or explain um, and explain that to us. And I don't know if this is really a metric, but a concept. Um, and I alluded to it earlier, but um, I, when I joined, built our portfolio construction model um, and have now we have a VP of finance, but um, I historically ran that. But I think sometimes that maybe just sounds kind of confusing. So I can talk about at a high level, like what that looks like for a fund like ours. Um, and it, I think sometimes like stuff like ownership targets and like it doesn't all make sense. So at a high level, por portfolio construction is like how a fund puts together their capital that they have to deploy. So um, if you have a $100 million fund, oftentimes like 20% of that is dedicated to fees. And so that leaves 80 million to invest. And so for a fund that's leading and following on, you're typically doing like 50, 50. So in that $80 million, like 40 million and then 40 million for initial and then the other half for follow on. Um, and so I think this also helps maybe as a founder, like they don't have $80 million to put to initial tax. Um, and so then you're usually gonna do around 30 companies, I would say most often it varies fund by fund. Some do more like up to 40, some do more concentrated 20. Um, and so that kind of gives you a sense of check size if you divide by that number. Um, and then thinking about ownership targets like that you can back into based on check size like what is kind of the valuation that a VC might be thinking about. And so much bigger funds, you know, have a little bit more capital to do deals at very high valuations. But I think for a fund like ours, we are more valuation sensitive just because when you look at like check size and ownership target, like the math doesn't work. Um, and then the follow on piece, it's as companies raise more, we obviously want to keep our ownership. And so we'll typically follow on up to the series B, but, you know, do get a little bit capped out beyond that, just because we only have that um, under this, you know, 100 million scenario, like it would only be 40 million to deploy into 30 ish companies, depending on which ones graduate. That was super helpful. Thank you. And are there like any questions that founders could be asking you either like at their first or second meeting? Like, when do you think it's appropriate for founders to try and like understand what your portfolio construction might look like? And because I do think it's important to like figure out if 
the fun would even be a fit just based on the pure mechanics of it. Yeah, I think asking about check size, owner, I don't always hear like ownership target. Um, if there is like a valuation range, I think that's pretty a, a good question to ask about if you save for follow on, um, especially as a lead investor, like you ideally want your lead to follow on in your next round to avoid signaling risk. Um, so yeah, I think kind of like all, all of those questions are fair game. And um, I most founders ask like a couple of them, but you know, don't, and I try to cover most of it up front too, but um, if it's not covered, you should definitely be asking. Okay, amazing. Um, and then favorite question, can you share a female founder, investor, or leader who inspires you and a bit about why? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we just had Toyin from City Block at our summit this summer, and I just, I'd heard her on like podcasts, but I'd never seen her in person. And I just like thought she was super, super compelling and powerful and um, obviously like comes from industry. And so um, I think their focus is, you know, it's one like I wasn't at BBG when they raised their first round, but I don't think we ever saw it. Um, But, you know, one that's like just super thesis aligned for us um, thinking about kind of like underserved patients. Um, and so thought her story and kind of like how she's built the company over time was really compelling. Another one that's kind of like come full circle is Rebecca Caden is a board member for a company that I like sourced when I was pretty early. So I'm, I'm so close with the company and on calls with her, but I just remember like when I thought, you know, she was like unreachable, like when I would listen to her on like podcasts when I was in business school and like thought she was so, so cool. And she's, you know, super valuable, it seems, um, to companies. And I've seen her give like very specific feedback, but also like able to um, kind of empathize with companies when needed. And so I I like that she has like a a well-rounded approach to supporting. Um, But it's just, it's cool now. And I'm like, I remember when that was, um, you know, she was like my idol when I was thinking about going into venture. And so it's cool to now um, see her um, in the day to day. Yeah. I love that so much. Um, Thank you for both shout outs. And then lastly, where can everyone find you and where can they find BBG Ventures? I think I mentioned our email earlier. Um, I also check LinkedIn, maybe not always, but I try to respond. Um, And then, yeah, I'm on Twitter too. I think Claire Bernax is my handle. Amazing. Well, Claire, thank you so much for joining the show. I know I learned a lot and I know everyone listening will too. Cool. Yeah, it was super fun. Thanks for having me.